TED Talk uh, today a little bit differently. I'll lead you through a guided meditation or guided visualization. Um, as Allison said, I teach at a variety of locations around Seattle and I want to set the scene a little bit. So I invite you to sit up nice and tall and close your eyes. Press your feet down into the floor and then roll your shoulder blades back and down your spine. And start to breathe a little bit deeper. Allow all of those thoughts swirling around in your mind to simply melt away. Let them pass. Now start to picture in your mind the perfect yoga studio. Start to see the dim lights and feel the warmth on your skin. Breathe in the smell of eucalyptus or lavender. See the pristine wood floors and the clean mirrors that surround the room. You're comfortable, you're warm, you feel welcomed and calm. Now start to picture your yoga instructor. She's wearing the same brand of yoga pants as you. She's not your favorite yoga instructor, but she'll do. You had to fit yoga in at 6 p.m. And while once the class gets started, you're gonna tune her out anyway. As you move and breathe, your chaotic day melts away. You move with ease. You connect easily with your body and how it feels. You move and breathe and pay little attention to the people or mats that surround you. Take a big breath in, fill up with this perfect experience. And exhale, let it go. And keep breathing. But now as you breathe in, you inhale stale air. It smells a little bit like an antique mall where everything is really old. The fluorescent lights are harsh and they keep you on edge. You unroll a borrowed mat and you take a seat. Your shoulders start to hunch and you look to your left and to your right and to your left again at the mats that unroll next to yours. You notice your yoga instructor next. She doesn't look like you expected. She's wearing baggy clothes and you notice she has a hole in her sock. And you decide you kind of like the hole because it matches the hole in your t-shirt. She speaks softly to you and asks you to sit up tall, but you feel the weight of your past mistakes pushing down on you. She asks you to breathe deeply. Listen to the beat of your heart, she says. And all of a sudden you realize that this is the first time in a long time that you felt your heart beating. It's beating, but not racing. You start to feel calm at ease and open. I take a big breath in and fill up with a sense of openness and ease. Big breath out. And slowly start to break, blink your eyes open. So tonight I'd like to tell you about my time behind bars and the lessons that I've learned from the people that I've met in prison. I wasn't arrested or charged or sentenced Unlike the people I serve in prison, I'm there voluntarily. I choose to step behind bars to teach incarcerated youth the benefits of the yoga practice. And I think it's important to keep this in mind as I share my lessons learned. While I choose to go to prison every Thursday evening for my students, prison is their sentence, not their choice. I work at Echo Glen Children's Center, which serves um, incarcerated boys aged, ages 8 to 18. And I'd like to acknowledge my privilege in standing in front of you tonight. And thank you for listening as I tell you some lessons I've learned from really brave yogis as they've tried to change their path. The two experiences that I've described are the two yoga worlds that I live in. The free world where I practice and teach yoga with people that look just like me. And my yoga practice behind bars. I get the honor of sharing my yoga practice in both spaces. But to be totally transparent, my yoga practice behind bars feels more like real yoga. It's more than poses, it's more than Spotify playlists and Lululemon, it's real. We get real behind bars. We talk about our feelings, we laugh, we fall over, we have bad days, and best of all, we breathe together. And that brings me to my first lesson that I've learned behind bars, to breathe first and move second. If you've ever taken a vinyasa yoga class, you know that in vinyasa yoga, 
Breath is a major component and a driving force of the yoga practice. So you pair every movement with a part of your breath. So you, would, you know, inhale upward facing dog, exhale downward facing dog, for example. Every action starts with the breath first. In life off the mat, though, this can be a real challenge. I mean, think about your day leading up to this moment right now, and how often did you stop and breathe before you took action? But imagine how different your day would have been if you had. Working with my yoga boys, we focus on the power of breath. It has the power to calm your mind and forces you to pause. It's the difference between accelerating a situation or walking away. Breathing first makes you delay action just for a moment, and in that moment, you have the space to reconsider. There is a risk to breathing deeply, though, and that brings me to my next lesson. <clears throat> Farts happen. And now this is actually a lesson that I learned six years ago when I started working as a middle school teacher, but I'm reminded of this lesson every Thursday. Sometimes you can be going about your business everything is great and then you encounter some shit. I mean if you've ever walked into a fart cloud unexpectedly it totally sucks but it's a good reminder that we've all got some shit that we're working out and this is important. I think there's a huge lesson in humility that you learn when you fart in the middle of a yoga class. You're forced to own your shit literally and figuratively. You're exposed and all you can do in that moment is say excuse me. This is powerful. You can't fix it, you can't change it. You just have to sit in it and let it pass. I couldn't really think of a way to connect farts with my next lesson, so here goes. Balance is hard. I have really weak ankles. Um, I have been really embarrassed about um, the, my weak ankles ever since I started practicing yoga. Um, I really wanted to be the picture-perfect yogi that could stand on one foot and hold her leg above her head and just balance for hours, but it never happened. I've been practicing yoga for over 10 years and I still have really weak ankles. But the difference now is that I'm not embarrassed about it. I embrace the shake. Um, a lesson that I've learned from my yoga boys is that there's a lot you can learn in those shaky moments those moments right before you start to fall, those moments when you fight to stay on your feet. And my yoga boys have experienced some really serious tragedies in their life, tragedy I can't even imagine. And when they step onto their mats, they bring all of that with them. And sure, they wobble or falter, fall over a little bit, grab onto the people around them for help, but they fight to stay on their feet. So whenever I feel unsure, whenever I feel like I can't stand on my own two feet, I think about my yoga boys. I'm reminded to lean in, to let myself shake, and to grab onto the people around me for support. And while we try really hard to stand on our, on our feet, sometimes we fall over. Even me. I know, I know, it's hard to believe that a yoga teacher could fall over in a yoga class, but it happens, it happens sometimes to fall down. And I tell my students, um, when you fall, you have two choices. You can hit the mat and stay down and let the pose defeat you, or you can bounce. You can bounce back up onto your feet, or you can bounce into something different. And the something different is key. We don't always have to get right back up on our feet and try again. Sometimes it's better to let yourself feel the fall and then move into a space or a shape where you can recover. I think there is a trap that we force our boys into, this trap of believing that they can't feel or they're not allowed to feel things. If you fall, don't cry, get up, be tough. And so we raise our boys to believe that they can't feel the fall, but rather that they have to pretend like it didn't happen, or worse, they have to deny the effects of their fall altogether. But what would happen if we gave each other permission to unapologetically feel the fall and to find a different shape. I can tell you what happens because it happens every Thursday in my yoga class. Something shifts. Falling stops being scary and they want to try new things because they're not afraid to fail. They just land on their mat, shake it off, and they find their next pose. And the best part of the fall in the yoga circle is the people standing around you. And this brings me to my next lesson. 
that kindness is small. In a world of restricted freedom and limited resources, kindness doesn't happen in grand gestures. Kindness is small. It's rolling up someone's mat at the end of class. It's listening to someone share their own work. It's eye contact. It's remembering someone's name. I go through my day with multiple people asking me, how was your day or how's it going? And these are three of the most inauthentic words in the English language. I mean, how many times do you ask someone, how are you, without much attention or thought to the answer? I'm guilty of it too. The phrase is common and fleeting as hello, or I love you, or I'm sorry. But in prison yoga, the how are you is the most important part of the class. My yoga boys come to class and they sit down on their mats and they ask me how I've been in the week since our last class, I know that they mean it. They care how I feel because I care how they feel when they step onto their mat. I have the privilege of being the one person in their week that gets on their level, looks them in the eye, and asks them how they're feeling. Kindness is small, and we need to teach ourselves and our kids how to recognize these small acts of kindness. And finally, my last lesson. Well, I think that apologies have, been have become somewhat of an automatic response to avoid conflict, especially in the Pacific Northwest where we're sort of major in being passive aggressive. <laughs> I think it's important to never forget the power of saying I'm sorry and meaning it. A few weeks after I started teaching yoga behind bars, I was teaching the students how to do this pose called Bound Full Locust Pose. So to get into the pose, you lay down on your mat face down and you interlace your hands behind your back. If you're imagining what this pose looks like, you should be horrified. This is the position that you see people in as they're being arrested. And actually, as I was teaching the pose, one of my yoga boys was like, oh, hey, this is under, you're under arrest pose. In that moment, I failed my students. In a matter of seconds, I had transformed the safe space of yoga into a flashback to a really traumatic experience in their past. I had failed, and all I could do was say, I'm sorry, and mean it. So I took a deep breath. I owned my shit. I felt my fall, and I allowed myself to be surrounded by the kindness in that circle. I end all of my yoga classes behind bars with a breath mantra. And a breath mantra is like a meditation that you take off your mat and into the rest of your day. It's like a reminder of a lesson that you learned in your yoga class. And we always breathe in something good and then exhale its opposite. So I'd like to end my TED talk today with a breath mantra, three of them actually. So in yoga class, you don't have to do this, but you're welcome to join me. You, we press our hands together at the center of our chest and then you push your thumbs into your heart or where your heart would be behind your ribs so that you connect to your heartbeat as sort of a reminder of that life force that's within all of us. And take a big breath in. And exhale. Inhale courage. Exhale doubt. Inhale kindness. Exhale indifference. And my students' favorite, inhale cheeseburgers. Exhale Brussels sprouts. Thank you.